Could Homo sapiens successfully interbreed with Denisovans, Neanderthals, and even potentially undiscovered human species? In this video we will discuss, if and when, and the potential for fertile offspring resulting from these unions. What does it mean to be human? For a long time, the answer seemed clear. Our species, Homo sapiens, with our complex thoughts and deep emotions, were the only true humans to ever walk the earth. Earlier forms, like the Neanderthals, were thought to be just steps along the path of evolution, who died out because we were better versions. That picture is now changing. In recent years, researchers have gained the power to pull DNA from ancient hominins, including our early ancestors and other relatives who walked on two legs. Ancient DNA technology has revolutionized the way we study human history and has quickly taken off with a constant stream of studies exploring the genes of long-ago people. Along with more fossils and artifacts, the DNA findings are pointing us to a challenging idea. We're not so special. For most of human history we shared the planet with other kinds of early humans, and those now extinct groups were a lot like us. We can see them as being fully human. But interestingly, a different kind of human, furthermore, humans had close, even intimate, interactions with some of these other groups, including Neanderthals, Denisovans, and several ghost populations we only know from DNA. In 2012, DNA analysis and statistical techniques were used to infer that a now extinct human population in northern Eurasia had interbred with both the ancestors of Europeans and a Siberian group that later migrated to the Americas. The group was referred to as a ghost population because they were identified by the echoes that they leave in genomes not by bones or ancient DNA. In 2013, another study found the remains of a member of this ghost group, fulfilling the earlier prediction that they had existed. The remains were a molar and a female juvenile's finger bone. This group was the Denisovans, an archaic human that ranged across Asia during the Lower and Middle Paleolithic. Archaics are distinguished from anatomically modern humans by having a thicker skull more prominent brow ridges, and the lack of a prominent chin. According to a study published in 2020, there are indications that 2% to 19%, so on average about 7%, of the DNA of four West African populations may have come from an unknown archaic hominin which split from the ancestor of humans and Neanderthals between 360,000 years ago to 1.2 million years ago. However, the study also suggests that at least part of this archaic admixture is also present in Eurasians and non-Africans, and that the admixture event or events range from 0 to 124,000 years ago, which includes the period before the out-of-Africa migration and prior to the African-Eurasian split, thus affecting in part the common ancestors of both Africans and Eurasians and non-Africans. It's a unique time in human history when there are only one of us. Scientists now know that after Homo sapiens first showed up in Africa around 300,000 years ago, they overlapped with a whole cast of other hominins. Neanderthals were hanging out in Europe. Homo heidelbergensis and Homo niledi were living in Africa. The short-statured Homo floriensis, known as the Hobbit, was living in Indonesia, while the long-legged Homo erectus was loping around Asia. Scientists started to realize all these hominins weren't our direct ancestors. Instead, they were more like our cousins, lineages that split off from a common source and headed in different directions. Archaeological finds have shown some of them had complex behaviors. Neanderthals painted cave walls, Homo heidelbergensis hunted large animals like rhinos and hippos, and even built the world's oldest known wooden structure. An arrangement of logs on the bank of a river bordering Zambia and Tanzania, made by shaping two logs with sharp stone tools, and may have formed part of a walkway or platform for our human ancestors or cousins who lived along the Colambo River nearly 500,000 years ago, that predates the rise of modern humans. And some scientists think even the small-brained Homo naledi was burying its dead in South African cave systems. For some, the mating was hard to imagine. Many argued that as Homo sapiens ventured out of Africa, they replaced other groups without mating. 
Archaeologist John Shea of New York Stony Brook University said he used to think of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens as rivals, believing if they bumped into each other, they'd probably kill each other. But DNA has revealed there were other interactions, ones that changed who we are today. In 2010, the Swedish geneticist Svante Pabo and his team pieced a tricky puzzle together. They were able to assemble fragments of ancient DNA into a full Neanderthal genome, a feat that was long thought to be impossible and won Pabo a Nobel Prize last year. This ability to read ancient DNA revolutionized the field, and it is constantly improving. For example, when scientists applied these techniques to a pinky bone and some huge molars found in a Siberian cave, they found genes that didn't match anything seen before. It was a new species of hominin, now known as Denisovans, as mentioned earlier, who were the first human cousins identified only by their DNA. Armed with these Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes, scientists could compare them to people today and look for chunks of DNA that match. When they did, they found clear signs of crossover. The DNA evidence showed that Homo sapiens mated with groups including Neanderthals and Denisovans. In Europe, Asia and North Africa, interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans with modern humans took place several times. The introgression events into modern humans are estimated to have happened about 47,000 to 65,000 years ago with Neanderthals and about 44,000 to 54,000 years ago with Denisovans. Neanderthal-derived DNA has been found in the genomes of most or possibly all contemporary populations, varying noticeably by region. It accounts for 1 to 4 percent of modern genomes for people outside sub-Saharan Africa, although estimates vary, and either none or possibly up to 0.3 percent according to recent research for those in Africa. It is highest in East Asians and Native Americans, intermediate in Europeans, and lower in Southeast Asians. Denisovan-derived ancestry is largely absent from modern populations in Africa, Western Asia and Europe. The highest rates of Denisovan admixture have been found in Southeast Asian, Australian Aborigines, and other Oceanian peoples. But the highest rate of all populations, by far, are the Melanesians, and the Negrito populations of the Philippines with around 4 to 6% of their genome derived from Denisovans. Indicating that there was interaction between the early ancestors of Melanesians with Denisovans, but that this interaction could not have take place in the regions near southern Siberia. Whereas of yet the only Denisovan remains have been found. Also, like I said earlier in the video, some human DNA reveals evidence of other, ghost populations groups who are part of our genetic code but whose fossils we haven't found yet. A factor in this is the unfortunate rapid decay of fossils in sub-Saharan African environments. Ancient DNA data from a 4,500-year-old Ethiopian highland individual, and from a South African individual 2,300 to 1,300 years old, and an Eastern and South Central African individual. 8,100 to 4,000 years old, clarified that some West African populations have small amounts of excess alleles. Best explained by an archaic source in West Africans that is not included in the pre-agricultural Eastern African hunter-gatherers and Southern African hunter-gatherer populations, or the genetic gradation between them. The West African groups carrying the archaic DNA include Yoruba from coastal Nigeria and men from Sierra Leone indicating that the ancient DNA was acquired long before the spread of agriculture and likely well before the Holocene. Such an archaic lineage must have separated before the divergence of the San ancestors, which is estimated to have begun on the order of 200 to 300,000 years ago. The hypothesis that there has been archaic line in the ancestry of present-day Africans that originated before the San, Pygmies and East African hunter-gatherers is supported by a line of evidence independent from the findings based on long haplotypes with deep divergences from other human haplotypes. A 2016 paper in the journal Evolutionary Biology argued that introgression of DNA from other lineages enabled humanity to migrate to and succeed in numerous new environments, with the resulting hybridization being an essential force in the emergence of modern humans. It's hard to pin down exactly when and where these interactions happened. 
our ancestors seem to have mixed with the Neanderthals soon after leaving Africa and heading into Europe, where they overlapped geographically for over 30,000 years. And they probably bumped into the Denisovans in parts of East and Southeast Asia. They obviously didn't have no maps, so they didn't know where they were going, but as they looked over the next hillside into the next valley, they would have ran into populations of people that looked a little different from themselves, but mated and exchanged genes. So even though Neanderthals did look distinct from Homo sapiens, from their bigger noses to their shorter limbs, and different skin color, it wasn't enough to create a wall between the groups. The new findings have completely appended the idea that earlier, more ape-like creatures started standing up straighter and getting more complex until they reached their peak form in Homo sapiens. Along with the genetic evidence, other archaeological finds have shown Neanderthals had complex behaviors around hunting, cooking, using tools and even making art. Still, even though we now know our ancient human cousins were like us, and make up part of who we are now, the idea of ape-like cavemen has been hard to dislodge. Artist John Gurch is trying. He specializes in creating lifelike models of ancient humans for museums including the Smithsonian and the American Museum of Natural History, in hopes of helping public perception catch up to the science. Skulls and sculptures gazed out from the shelves of his studio earlier this year as he worked on a Neanderthal head, punching pieces of hair into the silicone skin. Bringing the new view to the public hasn't been easy, Gurch said, this caveman image is very persistent. Getting the science right is crucial. Gerch has worked on the dissections of humans and apes to understand their anatomy, but also hopes to bring out emotion in his portrayals. These were once living, breathing individuals, and they felt grief and joy and pain, Gerch said, they're not in some fairyland, they're not some fantasy creatures. They were alive. I think this is very well said, sometimes you do forget that they were probably just like us, with all the same feelings and emotions. Scientists can't get useful genetic information out of every fossil they find, especially if it's really old, as DNA degrades over time, or also in the wrong climate. They haven't been able to gather much ancient DNA from Africa, where Homo sapiens first evolved, because it has been degraded by heat and moisture. Still, many are hopeful that as DNA technology keeps advancing, we'll be able to push further into the past and get ancient genomes from more parts of the world adding more brushstrokes to our picture of human history. Because even though we were the only ones to survive, the other extinct groups played a key role in our history, and our present. They are part of a common humanity connecting every person. If you look at the fossil record, the archaeological record, and the genetic record, you see that we share far more in common than what divides us.